Dante Certification Level 3, Second Edition. Tour of Network Connections. So we know that Dante will simultaneously use multiple connections, each connection with a different responsibility. It could be discovery, clocking, control, audio and video packets, and so on. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a document that listed all of these connections in one place? <laughs> Indeed we do. It's called, So You're Adding Dante to Your Network. In one page, this explains what an IT manager needs to know. And now that you've been through a lot of the networking education we have in Dante Certifications Level 1 through 3, let's take a look at this. Right at the top, it mentions that Dante devices can get IP addresses just like a computer. We can use DHCP if available, and we can revert to link local if it isn't. We use unicast and multicast traffic, and of course multicast can be managed with IGMP snooping. We suggest IGMP snooping version 3, but if you use version 2 for legacy reasons, we're good with that. Down a bit further, we see that our system can use quality of service to improve performance on a converged network when 100 megabit devices are deployed or when a network becomes congested. It lists all our DSCP labels with their priorities with a note that quality of service should be set up with strict priority, no round robin methods. We'll see a mention that we primarily use UDP traffic. A single unicast flow will bundle four audio channels together for about six megabits per second of data. Multicast will bundle up to eight channels together. Then we can also see a lot of multicast streams and port numbers listed, so we can make sure these are not blocked for any reason. All of this should be familiar to you now, and this knowledge is incredibly helpful when you're troubleshooting a system. When somebody contacts me for troubleshooting help, one of the first things I try to do is break it down into a category of a problem. So, is this a discovery problem? Is this a clocking problem? Is this a media packet problem? Or is it a latency problem? Let's walk through these. Step one is discovery. Can Dante controllers see the devices? If devices can't find each other, then they can't elect a clock master, synchronize, establish subscriptions, and things like that. So discovery is very fundamental. Now, based on the devices that are or are not showing up, I might be able to look at it and say, oh, maybe traffic is being blocked, maybe a device is in the wrong VLAN or the wrong subnet, something like that. But if our devices are being discovered properly, then we know at least something is working, and we move on to the next step. Step two is synchronization. Now that they see each other, they'll negotiate a clock leader. If synchronization can't be established, then there's no point in sending audio or video streams. The devices will just be muted anyway. One of the first things I'd look at is the clocking tab in Dante Controller, just to make sure that there's only one clock leader. If there's multiples, that probably means that clocking traffic is being blocked. If that checks out, then I would go to the clock histogram and make sure that we don't have a jitter problem on the network. Now, if we can discover all of our devices, we only have one clock leader, and the clock histogram is showing that we have a low jitter network, chances are we're going to be home free. Realistically, discovery and clocking both use multicast, which, if people get themselves into trouble, that's usually where it happens. Once we've cleared those hurdles, and we can see that we have a low jitter network, chances are we also have a low latency network. So let's go through the next step. So the final step is to figure out if we have a problem with media streams. Realistically, these types of problems might be revealed in Dante Controller. You'll remember we can take our cursor and do a tooltip rollover. It might tell us something like we've run out of flows, or we have devices at the wrong sample rate, right? something like that. Now, if all of this checks out, then you should be in good shape. One of the final things I'll check is the latency charts. If these show the data getting across the network in a reasonable amount of time, well, I'd say we have a healthy network. So let's draw a simple conference room here. Suppose we have a DSP, a beamforming microphone, an interface for your computer, a camera and a TV for video conferencing, and a set of speakers. So when we teach this class live, one of the questions that comes up is, 
if I have multiple ceiling speakers like this, do I need to have multiple network drops up there? And the answer is no. Dante doesn't drive speakers, right? Dante signal is usually sent to an amplifier. And of course, the amplifier then feeds speakers. If you have a traditional amplifier in a rack somewhere, um, that might be able to drive tens or hundreds of speakers, just depending on how much power it has. Now, in an example like this, it's the same type of idea, but the amplifier is built right into the back can now. Okay, it's PoE powered. So your network drop comes up here, and of course it feeds its internal speaker, but we also have connections for three more passive speakers. And of course this amplifier can be driven in mono or stereo. So it's a nice way to clean up a system if you just have a couple of speakers in a zone. Uh, this might be a space-saving design. All right, with that, let's get back to our discovery example. When Dante Controller launches, it will subscribe to a multicast stream at 224.0.0.251, port 5353. Now this discovery message is going to act like a party line phone. We'll be able to hear everybody that's talking back to us. And in fact, if multiple devices are subscribed, multiple devices will hear all of those announcements. That's why we can have multiple copies of Dante Controller on the network, and they'll all get the same information. Now, Dante Controller isn't the only thing receiving and using this information. Let me gray out our communication line so we can see what I'm adding. We can see every Dante device will subscribe to this stream as well. That is how Dante devices learn about other Dante devices on the network. Once they see a new device, they might trigger a new clock election process, or they might look down their list of subscriptions and see if there's a stream they need to get going. So, Discovery is a multicast stream, but once we want to start sending commands to a device, we'll probably start using unicast. Let's suppose someone wants to make a subscription. They click in the routing grid, and Dante Controller sends a command to the device that will receive the stream. That device responds with a multicast update that it is working on establishing the stream. When each instance of Dante Controller sees that, it will show us the hourglass in the routing screens. Now again, because the Dante devices were receiving the discovery messages before, it knows where to find the source of the signal, and it will request the stream. In this case, it knows to get the signal from this beamforming microphone. That device will then start sending the Dante stream. And once that's running, the DSP will send one more update that the stream is all good. When Dante controller sees that, it will replace the hourglass with a green check mark in the screen. Okay, so that's a detailed view of how this works through discovery, creating a subscription, and so on. Knowing that, we can use this information when we have to troubleshoot something. So one of the first things to recognize is we are strategically using a combination of unicast and multicast for different types of traffic. We'll choose those because they achieve different results, and of course they achieve different results because they follow different rules. Let's take a look at how they differ. In unicast, everything we learned about subnetting applies. A transmitter will look at an IP address and decide whether to send the packet to the device directly or to send it to the router. In multicast, the transmitter doesn't know who the receiver is. It just blindly sends the data to the network, stamping it with a subscription address. From there, it's up to the network switches to move the packets to their destinations. In a layer two space, all of this will really move by a MAC address. In unicast, the MAC address is listed right on the packet. With multicast, if multicast management, like IGMP snooping, is engaged, then it will look for subscription requests. But of course, if there is no multicast management, then the multicast just repeats to every port, right? Finally, once the packet arrives at the receiver, the device will see which internal service registered for this packet. Receivers expecting unicast will register for an IP port. Multicast subscriptions will be relevant for the IP address and the IP port. So the differences certainly abound, but let's see how this would impact discovery. What happens if you mess up your IP address? Let's suppose that you pre-programmed this DSP. Back at the office, you had a different subnet than what the customer is using. And of course, back at the office, you might have had to use a static IP. So now you bring this into the customer's network and, ah, 
I forgot to release that static IP. Okay, here's what happens. Dante Controller will subscribe to the multicast stream. And since multicast isn't dependent on subnet rules, we will receive the discovery message from that transmitter. So far, so good. But now we want to be able to send a command to that DSP, perhaps to get more detailed status information or to create a subscription. Well, that command is going to be sent by unicast. Now we're back to following the rules of subnets. When the laptop sees the IP address of that DSP, it will determine that it's not in the same subnet, and it will send that to the router. The router will begin looking for that address on other VLANs. It'll be looking in the wrong place, and it won't complete the connection. To alert you to that issue, Dante Controller can show the device in red. And as I've said before, anytime Dante Controller shows you a picture, a color, a graphic, it has a purpose. If you double click on the device in red, Dante Controller may be able to give us more information about this device. In this case, we can see it's listed in a different subnet. Okay, well that's helpful information. I could take my laptop, set it to a static IP in the same subnet with this DSP, and then make the changes to get everything back where it should be. I don't have to worry about uh, factory resetting everything and losing all my work, right? Okay, let's try another scenario. What if everything is showing up in red? Did you put every device in the wrong subnet? Well, I suppose that's possible. However, it's also possible that your laptop is the one device that's in the wrong subnet. Since laptops move around a lot, and we often need to be at specific addresses when we're commissioning things, we may have forgotten to move back to auto IP addressing. Well, here's another possibility. If you're on a system with redundant networks, you might have your laptop on the wrong network. If Dante Controller is expecting to be on the Dante primary network, but you've connected it to the secondary, it will show the devices in red. I think these issues are all pretty straightforward. They're just simple mistakes that we make during commissioning and can be easily fixed. Finally, what happens if Dante Controller can't show you anything? Well, this is a conundrum. And what I would probably start with is figuring out whether this is a problem on the laptop or a problem on the network. I'll start with the obvious stuff. Make sure that Dante Controller is looking at the right network port. Maybe it's looking at Wi-Fi when you think it's looking at the wired port. Now, if I've never seen this copy of Dante Controller work before, maybe this is a new computer to me, then what I might do is just pull out a known working computer, connect it to the network, and see what happens. If that computer works fine, then we know it's something in this computer. It could be something as simple as security software blocking access to certain ports, um, or, of course, maybe a magic reboot or reinstalling Dante Controller just to make sure that the installation went properly. If all that checks out and I'm on a larger network with a lot of configuration, another simple step is to plug directly into a Dante device. If the device has redundant ports and the secondary is free, make sure the device is set into switched mode and plug directly into the secondary port. By doing this, we'll get the automatic IP configuration from the network, but we'll be able to get traffic directly from the Dante device. We won't have to worry about any traffic management blocking anything from the network switch. If the device doesn't have redundant ports or it requires PoE, don't despair. You can get the same effect with a small unmanaged switch. This would do the same trick, which is why I always carry one in my troubleshooting kit. So if a direct connection works, but a connection across the larger network doesn't, at least you know the Dante device and your laptop are working properly. The problem then must be on the larger network. And mind you, since we work on unconfigured networks, this is probably something you did or an IT manager did in configuration. Now, generally speaking, block traffic is the result of a policy that's been put in place on the network. Could be something simple. Maybe you've turned on IGMP snooping on your switches, but you forgot to establish an IGMP querier. Well, in that case, multicast traffic comes into your switches and the switches hold it, looking for the subscription list that will never come because there is no IGMP querier. Another thing that we haven't talked about is access control lists, or ACLs. Now, access control lists are ways of blocking traffic based on 
the MAC address based on the port number, something like that. And IT managers will use that to restrict access to certain parts of the network, keeping it more secure. Now, if this is your network, well, you know what policies you've put in place. You can strip them away one at a time until things start working again. And then when things start working, put them back one at a time, ensuring things continue to work. And then you'll know which policy it is. If this is not your network, if you're getting on a network with an IT manager, now you need to make a meeting with them. What I generally recommend then is send them a communication asking for a meeting, right? Don't just walk into their office and say, I need help right now. <laughs> Set up a meeting. When you go in there, um, they'll be able to see that you know what you're talking about when it comes to networks. If you have a document like this and you're willing to walk them through it and point out which ones you're concerned about, and if you're willing to do this on their timetable, generally I've seen great help from the IT manager. Treat them as you would like to be treated yourself. So with that, I hope this has been a helpful tour of some basic communications and that it gives you some ideas on how to troubleshoot a system should something go wrong.